Hello, friends, and welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. Pastor James Rafferty here, and we are continuing our study in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, and our title today is The Time of the End. So glad you've joined us. Uh, part two of a series, don't know how long, this, how long the series is going to be. It just depends on how long it takes us to get through all of the prophetic material in Daniel, chapter 11. The Time of the End is based on... Uh, this phrase that's found in the book of Daniel chapter uh, 11 and verse 40. Our scripture reading right now is Daniel 12 verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the word, seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So before we get into our study, let's just take a moment to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide our minds and our hearts. Father in heaven, again, we just want to thank you as we pause in your presence, asking for the promise of the Holy Spirit to guide our minds and our hearts as we delve into these prophetic chapters of Daniel and Revelation. Uh, we're in Daniel chapter 11 specifically. We're going to be comparing that with Revelation and we're going to be looking for answers to the prophetic history that you've laid out for us so clearly and its fulfillment in these last days. We believe we're living in the time of the end, but how do we know that? Father, please direct us. Please instruct us. Please show us things to come as you promised through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be with our viewers, be with their hearts, be with their minds, give clarity, give understanding, and bless us so that we can be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're asking all of this in his wonderful name. Amen. The time of the end. This is quite an important topic in relationship to Bible prophecy because it's mentioned again and again in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, as we just read. We need to understand as we review a little bit from our first session together, we need to understand how we can unlock Daniel chapter 11 verses 28 to 45. And one of the keys that we looked at in unlocking this is understanding the Holy Covenant because the power in Daniel chapter 11 verses 28 through 45 is after the Holy Covenant, indignant against the Holy Covenant, seeing to corrupt the Holy Covenant, it is attacking God's Holy Covenant. So we looked at the Holy Covenant in our first session. If you haven't seen that presentation, please go back and look at that presentation because if you don't understand the Holy Covenant, it's going to be hard to follow the prophetic insights that God has given us in Daniel chapter 11. Another key we looked at is the principle of repeat and enlarge. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11 are going through prophetic history which is actually world's history in advance and they're outlining the same basic powers, earthly powers. In Daniel 2 it's an image. In Daniel 7 it's animals. In Daniel 8 it's a uh, ram and a he-goat. In Daniel 11, it's the king of the north and the king of the south, the king of the north and the king of the south. But each one of these chapters parallels the other, laying out Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, paper Rome, and then some undisclosed information in Daniel before Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom. We've got the 10 horns, but from then on, we're not really sure. So we're looking to understand this last part of Daniel chapter 11. In Daniel 11 verse 29 we looked at a verse that says at the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. And this really helped us because what we did here was we laid out the three phases of Rome. Pagan Rome is the former, healed papal Rome is the latter, and the one that we looked at in our first study was the rise of papal Rome in verses 28 through 40. So we look at our outline here. This is what we have so far. We have pagan, pagan Rome as the form of uh, Roman power. We have the rise of papal Rome in the Dark Ages. And then we have a healed papal Rome that's going to come in the latter part of these verses. If only we had a Daniel chapter 13. That was what we asked ourselves. If only we had a Daniel chapter 13 to help us figure out the last part of Daniel chapter 11. Daniel doesn't go to 13. It goes to, to 12. It kind of closes up there in chapter 12. We noted that the first three verses of chapter 12 really belong to the vision of Daniel 11. And then there's this instruction that's given to Daniel. Seal up the words, seal up the prophecy till the time of the end. Many will run to and fro. Knowledge will be increased. But there's no chapter 13. There's no fifth vision. Or is there? 
What we're looking for is a vision that would repeat the cycle that we find in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 11. This would be a vision or a prophetic chapter of the Bible that would talk about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and then give more light on the subject just before God's kingdom is set up. We do not have a Daniel chapter 13. However, we do have a Revelation chapter 13. And it's no coincidence that Revelation chapter 13 actually connects with Daniel. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11 connects with Revelation chapter 13 in an amazing way. In fact, some people have called these two books twin prophetic books, the prophetic twins of the Bible, because Revelation and Daniel connect together. Let's just take a look in Revelation chapter 13. We'll begin in Revelation chapter 13 with verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So the first thing that we're seeing here in relationship to Revelation chapter 13 is a beast. And in Bible prophecy, a beast represents an earthly kingdom or power. This beast has seven heads and ten horns. Now, if we go back to Daniel, we're going to find that a beast was also identified with having ten horns in Daniel chapter 7. And so we see here a connection perhaps between Daniel 7, one of the parallel chapter, prophetic chapters of Daniel, and Revelation 13. Let's keep reading in Revelation 13 and see what else we find. Revelation 13 verse 2. The beast that I saw, this is an earthly kingdom coming out of the sea, which represents peoples, nations, multitudes, and kings. The beast that I saw was like a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth was as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Whoa, this is really significant because we're now we're looking at the very same images that we found in the book of Daniel, specifically in Daniel chapter 7. We not only have these 10 horns, which represent the European nations that came after the fall of pagan Rome, but we have the, the leopard-like body, which represents Greece. And we have the feet of a bear. The bear represented Medo-Persia. And then we have the mouth of a lion. The lion represented Babylon. And then we have the dragon giving seat and power power, that dragon, of course, representing the fourth power, the fourth beast, the terrible beast, the nondescript beast, uh, the dragon beast, if you will, in Daniel chapter 7. So we have all of these same powers laid out here in symbolic representation in Revelation 13 that we see in Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, and 11. Here's what it looks like as we uh, go on in Revelation chapter 13. Verse 3, and I saw one of his heads, that is one of the heads of this beast that comes out of the sea. I saw one of its heads at, as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Now this is really interesting because this is adding some insight to Daniel chapter 11. Notice if we lay this out in Revelation chapter 13, we have the European nations, which is the seven heads and ten horns. Then we have Greece, the leopard-like body. Then we have Medo-Persia, the feet of a bear. Then we have Babylon, the mouth of a lion. Then we have pagan Rome, seat and power from the dragon. And then we have papal Rome, because papal Rome receives this deadly wound in 1798 from atheism. Atheism actually historically wounds papal Rome in 1798. Now, We've jumped into the book of Revelation and we've jumped into that interpretation without giving the history. We're going to go back and look at the history, but I just want you to see, first of all, the connection between these two verses. Because when we look in Revelation chapter 13, we're looking at a repeat and enlarge of Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 11. And the reason we know that is because in Revelation 13, as this beast, earthly power, Daniel 7, 17, and 23, comes up out of the sea, peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues, that is a populated area of the earth, Revelation 17, verse 15, we see this beast, this earthly power, having the same characteristics of the powers in Daniel. 
That means it's following these powers. It has the horns, it has the leopard-like body, it has the feet like a bear, it has the mouth like a lion, and it has the seat and authority given by the dragon. And then we see some more insight given in Revelation 13 that we may have missed in Daniel 11. And that insight is, is that this beast receives a deadly wound. And we know the papacy was wounded with a mortal or deadly wound in 1798 when the French general Berthier went and took the Pope captive. We'll talk about it a little bit more as we get back into Daniel. And so we see all of this taking place. And as we see this outline, it reminds us of this amazing way that God repeats and enlarges the prophetic picture, not just in the book of Daniel, but also in the book of Revelation, helping us to see more truth to help us see the future that is ahead of us, to see around the corner so that we are prepared and not scared for the events that are just before us. Then Revelation 13 verse 11 says this, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake like a dragon. Now what's really interesting about this other beast is that it's not really mentioned in Daniel chapter 11. We don't see another beast in Daniel chapter 11 or Daniel chapter 7 or Daniel chapter 2 or Daniel chapter 8. We don't see another beast coming up out of the earth. Revelation 13 is giving us more light on the prophecies of Daniel. It's a supplement, if you will, to the book of Daniel. It's giving us additional information about our prophetic history, which is going to be human history, earth's history in the end of time. So we want to understand this beast, the lamb-like horns. I'm just going to throw it out there for now. We're going to get right into to seeing and understanding this uh, from a biblical perspective. But right now, I just want to throw it out there. This... Uh, earthly power, beast is an earthly power that rises up out of the earth in contrast to the sea, a populated area. This is a less populated area of the world. This less populated area signified by the earth has a, a, an earthly power that comes up with two horns like a lamb. A lamb is Jesus Christ. Horns represent their powers, the powers within that earthly power. And those two powers would represent civil and religious liberty because the lamb symbolizes liberty and freedom. Jesus Christ came to set us free from sin and bondage from all the constraints and the force, if you will, of mankind and to liberate us, free us from our sins and restore us to his image that we were created in, which is the, the uh, image of God and the image of freedom and choice. So what we have here is the United States of America. Now, I'm, I still need to, we, we're in a future presentation, we're gonna prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. But I just want to throw that into the picture right now as we go back and look at our chart. Let's just go back and look at this chart. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, Revelation 13. What do we have in Revelation 13? We have Babylon, remember, the mouth of a lion. We have Medo-Persia, remember, the feet of a bear. We have Greece, remember, the body of a leopard. We have pagan Rome, remember, the dragon that gave him a seat, power, and great authority. We have papal Rome, remember, he rises up and he receives a deadly wound. We have atheism then because atheism inflicts the deadly wound and we have a America, because America is that lamb-like, the, the beast with lamb-like horns. So this Revelation 13 picture is helping us to see more of what's taking place in Daniel chapter 11. We add these features to Daniel chapter 11, these features from Revelation chapter 13, and it fills out the picture. But can we do that? Can we add to Daniel 11 what's in another book of the Bible, another prophetic book of the Bible? Can we make that connection? Well, Daniel chapter 7 added to Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel chapter 8 added to Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel chapter 11 added to Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2. So it would just be consistent for us to recognize that the book of Revelation, another prophetic book that is identifying the same symbols in the book of Daniel, would be adding to Daniel 11 and Daniel 8 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 2. It's just repeating and enlarging and giving us a bigger picture. In fact, Revelation 13 is not the only chapter in Revelation that does this. Revelation chapter 17 also does this and it takes us right down to the very end of time, the time in which we're living right now. We're going to have time to go through that in a later uh, presentation, but not right now. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 11 and pick up in verse 40. What we're looking for is we're looking for atheism, 
to inflict a deadly wound and we're looking for the rise of America in Daniel chapter 11. I mean, I don't know that they'll be there necessarily, but let's see if they are in the context of prophetic history, which is played out in our earth's history. Let's see if these two characters are betrayed there. Daniel chapter 11 verse 40 reads like this. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. All right, we're going to start with this phrase, the time of the end. The time of the end. When do we arrive at that prophetic period of the time of the end? And that takes us to our scripture reading. Our scripture reading was found in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Let's take a look at that again. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even till the time of the end. Continuing, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So the time of the end is identified here in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel is told in verse 40 that a king of the south is going to rise up against this king of the north and push at him and that time of the end is identified in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 as a time when knowledge would be increased. What knowledge was going to be increased? Well, Daniel was told in the context of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 to seal up his book, to shut it up. It wasn't going to be known. It wasn't going to be understood. You're not going to understand this, Daniel. People at the end of time will understand it. That's us. Praise God. But you're not going to understand it, Daniel. So the knowledge that's going to be increased is a knowledge of the prophecies that Daniel didn't understand. That's the first knowledge. But there's also this need for technology to be increased. So we're going to see two things here. We're going to see the increase of biblical knowledge and we're going to see the increase of technology uh, as at large in our world. I'm going to see both of these things take place somewhere around the time of the end. We still need to identify what the time of the end is. But let's just look for the increase of biblical knowledge and let's look for the increase of technology and maybe we can pinpoint then the biblical time of the end. Let's just look first of all at the biblical part of the increase of knowledge. You know, in 1799, the London Religious Tract Society was formed. Then in uh, 1804, the British and Foreign Bible Society was formed. Then in, in 1816, the American Bible Society was formed. And in, and in 1825, the American Tract Society was formed. And today, parts of the Bible have been translated into over 2,000 languages. And it's estimated that there are over 9 billion copies of the Bible distributed in the last 200 years. Now, some more conservative estimates are 5 billion to 7 billion. We really don't know for sure how many copies of the Bible have been made, but we know it's in the billions. We know, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. So this is interesting because before 1798, there weren't any Bibles. Well, hardly any Bibles. There's just a few million Bibles. There weren't even enough Bibles for every member of the church I belong to, which is about a 20 million member church, to have one Bible. There weren't even 20 million Bibles in the world. Now, in the last two years, there are over well, let's just say there are five to seven billion plus, five to seven billion plus Bibles. So what happens when the Bible is made available? Well, it brings a worldwide religious awakening. That's exactly what happened when the Bible became available to the people by the millions and the billions. Eventually, there was a religious awakening. People began to read the Bible and they began to read the prophecies and they began to study the prophecies and they began to realize, hey, the word of God is powerful. The word of God is accurate. And and this awakening that took place that swept the world caused people to come to an understanding of Daniel's prophecies. And we may have time to go into that a little bit later, but we want to go now to technology. You know, in 1798, gas lighting and the cast iron plow were still recent developments. Did you know that electricity was just a, a laboratory experiment? And yet in the last, oh, let's just say the last uh, 200 years, we've gone from horse and buggy uh, to space travel. I mean, things have developed so far fast. If you think about it, horse and chariot and horse and buggy from 1800s all the way back to Christ day and beyond. And then all of a sudden, and that's what we're talking about, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. And all of a sudden we get to 1798. And in 200 years, we go from horse and buggy all the way to space travel. It's incre incredible. In fact, the Chicago Republicans said that the rapid strides which the world is making 
making in science and general intelligence and invention is the most striking characteristic of our time, and that was in March of 1872. Another article from that same era said, never was there such an activity of invention within the history of mankind as at the present day, and that was April of 1871. So we're seeing amazing strides both in spiritual knowledge and in intellectual knowledge increasing from 1798. That's where we marked the establishment, or 1799, the establishment of, of the London, London Tract Society. Now let's go back to our verse, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. At the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. Who's the king of the south? Well, if you look up the Strong's definition for South, you're going to find that the word South is derived from a Hebrew word which occasionally translates Egypt. Egypt is also the country that lay South to God's people in the Bible, South of Israel. And then the word South is biblically referred to as the country of Egypt in Bible verses like Isaiah chapter 30, verses one through seven. So definitely here we're talking about the king of the South being a symbol or representation of the country South of literal Israel, of the country of Egypt. Let's look at this Bible verse in Exodus chapter five and verse two to understand what God's trying to communicate to us in relationship to Egypt and the use of Egypt in Bible prophecy. It says here in uh, Exodus five, verse two, now this is the story of Moses delivering his people through the power of God. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. All right. so. This is basically uh, a power that refuses to acknowledge God, that refuses to acknowledge his power and his will in biblical times. Moses was led of God to deliver his people and the Pharaoh said, I'm not acknowledging you, God. I don't even know you, God. I, I don't want, want anything to do with this God. I won't let your people go. So the, the South would represent earthly powers that refuse to acknowledge God. And, and the question we wanna ask is then, is atheism a major biblical player in biblical prophecy? Is a power that refuses to acknowledge God, refuses to acknowledge the existence of God, refuses to, to do God's will, as we see in Exodus chapter 5 too, is that power, that atheistic power that rejects God, is, does that power play a major part in Bible prophecy, is identified in Bible prophecy? And the answer to that is yes. We want to look at, X, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7, it says here, and again, this is another prophetic chapter. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, a beast again represents, in Bible prophecy, represents an earthly power kingdom. So we have this beast, this earthly power, rising up out of the bottomless pit and making war against God's two witnesses, which would be the Old and New Testament. So a beast would represent an earthly power rising up and making war against God's two witnesses. Revelation chapter 11 verses 7 and 8 are identifying an atheistic power because God's two witnesses represent the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible. And history tells us that in France, atheism rose up and burned the Bible in the streets. It dethroned the God of heaven and it made war on the Bible. This is what is being identified here in Revelation chapter 11 verses 7 and 8. So yes, atheism is a major player in Bible prophecy. So let's go back to our verse here, verse 40 of Daniel 11. At the time of the end, 1798, coming to the end of the 18th century, shall the king of the south, atheism, push at him. Now that word push means to gore or to war according to the Strong's definition. So we wanna ask the question, did atheism rise on the world scene with military force toward the end of the 18th century? Did atheism rise up on the world scene according to Revelation chapter 11, the, the two witnesses would be made war against by a beast, an earthly power rising up to make war. And that power was identified spiritually as Sodom and Egypt. Remember, Egypt represents a power that doesn't acknowledge God. So that's a, a power that says, no, I don't, I don't acknowledge God. I don't know who your God is. And I don't, I'm not gonna acknowledge his will. I'm not gonna let those people go. So that would be an atheistic power. Did that power rise up somewhere in the world and make war against this papal power, against this Roman papal power, the king 
of the North toward the end of the 18th century? And the answer is absolutely yes. This is exactly what happened. We're told that in 1798, Berthier, which was the general of uh, uh, Napoleon, he went in, he marched into Rome, he abolished the papal government, and he established a secular one in its place. And that's the Encyclopedia Americana, 1941 edition. So we see an exact fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the history of the French, of Berthier, of Napoleon, of the imprisonment of the Pope in February 1798. This was the infliction of a deadly wound. It didn't destroy the papacy because the papacy was a twofold power. It was a religious power and it was a civil power. It took away its civil power, it took away its civil government, it took away its civil dominance, which was predicted in Daniel 7:25 to last for a time times and a half a time. In Revelation chapter 11, in Revelation chapter 12, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4 to last for 42 months, for 1260 years, for a time, time and a half a time. All of those prophetic uh, uh, timelines come out to uh, 1260 literal years. That is 1260 prophetic days, day for a year, Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 14 34, 1260 literal days. That's what we see from 538 to 1798. So we see the king of the north being inflicted, warred against by the king of the south, an atheistic power. We see this being fulfilled in our history. In fact, let's read a little bit about this history. It says, uh, here, the horrors of the French Revolution were needless to write. It was enough to say that the blood of saints began to be avenged, ties were abolished, monasteries suppressed, church lands confiscated, priests were despoiled and beggared, and at a time when every other form of faith was tolerated and atheism itself esteemed rather a virtue than a vice, and religious liberty proclaimed, the clergy of France were required to abjure all allegiance to the see of Rome, and that church was deprived of its earthly power or the dominion forcibly taken from its hands. And that Signs of the Times, Volume 2, 3rd edition. Basically, this is a summary of the history of atheism's rise in France and inflicting that deadly wound against the papacy. Let's look at another statement. This one uh, says, um, Library of, of the University of History, Volume uh, 8. It says, Infidelity and atheism reign supreme, supreme. The National Convention, that is in France, abolished the Sabbath, and the leaders of the Paris Commune declared that they intended to dethrone the King of Heaven as well as the monarchs of the earth. So this was the infliction of the deadly wound. This was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his mortal wound was healed and all the world wondered, marveled and followed the beast. So let's get back to our chart. Let's get back to this outline. Let's just take another look at this. Daniel chapter 2, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. Daniel chapter 7, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. Daniel chapter 8, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. Daniel 11, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. Atheism, verse 40 of Daniel chapter 11, atheism, the king of the south, atheism, pushed against, warred against the king of the north, papal Rome. Daniel, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 13, Babylon. Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, atheism. He was wounded with a deadly wound. That's atheism in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. So it's amazing, really. You see the parallels. Revelation 13 and Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 11 are parallel prophecies. Revelation 13 is connecting us with Daniel chapter 11, filling in some of the details, some of the prophetic history that's outlined there. Revelation 13 is expanding upon that. The deadly wound, the goring in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. Atheism rising up, the king of the south in Revel, uh, Daniel ch chapter 11 and verse 40. So let's go back now, answer another question. Did the persecution of atheism against papal Rome end in France or did it eventually spread to other countries in Europe and around the world? Let's just take a look at some statements from current more current news. Time Magazine, December 4, 1989. Until recently, the battalions of Marxism, that's atheism, communism, seemed to have the upper hand over the soldiers of the cross. In the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, Lenin had pledged toleration but delivered terror. Stal Russia turned crimson with the blood of martyrs, says Father Gleb uh, Yukonin, Russian Orthodox bravest agitator for religious freedom. In the Bolsheviks' first five years in power, 28 bishops and 1,200 priests were cut down by the Red Sickle. Stalin 
greatly accelerated the terror, and by the end of Khrushchev's rule, liquidations of clergy reached an estimated 50,000. After World War II, fierce but generally less bloody persecution spread into the Ukraine and, and the new Soviet bloc affecting millions of Roman Catholics and Protestants as well as Orthodox. So you see that pushing, that goring, that warring against the King of the North continued from 1798. It continued affecting millions of Roman Catholics and taking out thousands of priests and a dozen or so bishops also. Question. Did atheism completely destroy the papacy? Or would the king of the north, the papacy, return to a place of worldwide prominence? What does the Bible say? Not what I think, not what you think, not what some other commentators, commentators says. What does the Bible say? Notice what the verse says again in Daniel 11, verse 40. At the time of the end, 1798, the king of the south, atheism, would push at him, war against him, gore him, but, and, the, and, and the king of the north, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So we see a revival here of the king of the north power. We see a revival here of the papal power. And that fits perfectly with what we understand history to have laid out for us. In 1989, we read this article from U.S. News and World Report, Gorby's bow to Roman legions. Interesting, isn't it, how they use that terminology, Roman legions. Gorby, of course, represents Gorbachev. He was the leader of the Soviet Union at that time. He bows to the Roman legions representing the Pope, the Pope of Rome, the Pope of papal, uh, pap the papacy, the papal Roman power, of course, the fourth power in Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, and 11. Uh, supplemented by Revelation chapter 13. So it's amazing what we're seeing here because as we go back to our chart and we fill this out, Revelation chapter 13, Daniel chapter 11, we have atheism, but then we have papal Rome in Daniel chapter 11 and we have the United States in Revelation 13. Now, now I want you to notice something here. You have two different powers in these chapters. Daniel 11 gives us pap pap papal Rome re restored, healed, but Revelation 13 gives us the United States. However, the United States, we're told in Revelation 13, makes an image to that first power, earthly power beast, which we've identified as Papal Rome. So they're connected together in Revelation chapter 13. And we'll study that more as we continue on with this series. But are they connected with, together in Daniel chapter 11? Is the papacy and the United States connected in Daniel chapter 11? That's the question we want to answer. So Gorby's Battle of the Roman Legions, uh, U.S. News and World Report, this, is, this sets an indelible mark in prophetic history. In fact, Time Magazine in December 3, 1990 said, when the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV decided to seek pardon of Pope Gregory VII in 1077, he stood barefoot for three days in the snow outside the papal quarters in Canossa, Italy. That's just history. You can find that almost anywhere. I'd recommend reading the book, The Great Controversy. He has this history in it. Notice, though, what Time Magazine goes on to say, though Gorbachev's concordant with the church was less arduous, it was no less significant in its way. His treaty with the papacy wasn't as arduous as it was back in the day with Henry, but it was no less significant. He didn't have to stand outside barefoot in the snow for three days, but the significance of that concordat, the significance of that agreement, was no, it was no less significant in its way. In fact, prison um, fellowship, uh, Chuck Colson's uh, Jubilee, uh, magazine, April of 1990, talked about this freedom movement. And it said in Poland, the freedom movement was born almost three decades ago when the Bishop of Krakow sought to build uh, approval to build a new church. Uh, when communist authorities denied his application, the bishop had a giant cross erected and celebrated open air masses. The communists tore it down. The church members replaced it over and over again until finally the communists gave up. And that bishop of Krakow became John Paul II, a hero figure in Poland, the one who initiated the fall of communism in his home country of Poland. And this is how it all began, according to Chuck Colson and his prison uh, fellowship article. So Life Magazine also talked about this history. And the question that was asked in Life Magazine was going back in history to Joseph Stalin. In 1935, Joseph Stalin, absolute ruler of the Soviet Union, was given some unsolicited advice. Make a propitiatory gesture to the Vatican, he was told. Pushed too far, his country's Catholic Catholics might become counter-revolutionary. Stalin's great mustache amplified his sneer. The Pope? 
And how many divisions has he? The answer then was that he had none. The answer now is that he needs none. The structures of communism are crumbling to the touch. Cries for independence can be heard throughout the Baltic. So get what's taking place here. This is just powerful. Basically what current news is telling us is that John Paul II was sneered at by the communists when they were in, invited, they were uh, counseled to just make a butchery gesture, just reach out and just, you know, in a positive gesture. No, he doesn't have any tanks. He doesn't have any guns. He doesn't have any military. Why should I in any way seek to appease him? Well, then maybe you didn't need to, but now everything's falling. Communism communism is falling and who's the person behind the fall of communism according to bible prophecy it's the king of the north according to our understanding the king of the north is the papacy according to current news gorbachev is bowing to roman legions picture of gorbachev and the pope you see how it's all coming together pushed too far was what the article said that's the very word that's used in daniel 11 verse 40 the king of the south would push at him push him too far and guess what's going to happen the king of the north is going to come back against him like a whirlwind so the Bible says in Revelation 13, 3, and I'm reading the NAS here, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed. If you lived during this time, this was amazing. That's what the Bible verse is telling us. The whole world was amazed. I lived during this time. I became a Seventh-day Adventist in 1984, and I remember living under the octopus, the red octopus of the USSR. I remember going to Daniel seminars, and I remember Adventist prophecy, uh, evangelists prophesying that, you know, the whole world's going to wander after the papacy, and, and everyone's going to acquiesce to the papacy. I thought, really? Right now, with the USSR having more missiles and more tanks and more subs than America, the whole world's going to follow the papacy. Really? That was in 1984. I accepted the Adventist prophetic message by faith because Daniel 2 was so powerful and Daniel 7 was so powerful and Daniel 8 was so powerful. Daniel 11, I wasn't sure about. Revelation 13 was powerful, but ooh, I just didn't see it happening yet. Five years later, 1984, 1985, 1986, 1987, 1989, when communism fell, my faith skyrocketed. I was amazed. I was like, this is amazing. But it wasn't just the fulfillment of prophecy. It was some of the words that were used to describe the fulfillment of this prophecy. The prophecy said he would be wounded and his deadly wound would be healed. Notice what the Catholic register said about this event in December 1989. This, Gorbachev's visit, is a sign that the church has resisted that the persecution by atheism, communism, has wounded it, but not destroyed it. Whoa, that's exactly what it says in Daniel chapter, or excuse me, in Revelation chapter 13. So it blew me away because it was so precise. In fact, let's look in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40 again and look at some of these other words that are so precise or these descriptions. It said, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and shall enter into the countries and overflow and pass over. I want to Look at that word overflow for a second because in the Strong's, in the, in the original language, that word means to wash off or to wash over or to overflow. Life magazine was describing this same event in Life Magazine, December of 1989, it described the triumph of John Paul II. And notice what it says here. The tide of freedom washing over Eastern Europe answers his most fervent prayer. This is incredible when you think about it because basically these news articles are using some of the same terminology, wounded, pushed, washing over, overflowing, that the Bible is using to describe this event. Then it goes on to say, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he will enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. How did he enter into the countries? Well, when you think about this, it's really significant because Poland, for example, was a Catholic country that was controlled by communism. In Poland, uh, Reader's Digest, March of 1990 says, in Poland, the Catholic population saw John Paul II as a hero figure. And when Tadej Mazowiecki took over in August of 1999 as Poland's first non-communist prime minister, in 45 years, he was asked if he was a socialist. I am a Catholic, he answered 
tersely. So we see here the Catholic Church overflowing and flow, entering into the countries, taking control, political control, Catholic leaders stepping in. In fact, Time Magazine, December 3, 1990 said, due to Gorbachev's, Gorbachev's policy change, the papacy reestablished its church services, confiscated church buildings were returned, and Catholic bishops and clergy were dispatched to communist countries where the Catholic Church was once strictly banned by the government and thereby unlawful and heavily persecuted. Confronted with the task of evangelizing the formula, form, formerly communist countries of Eastern Europe and the new tolerant Soviet Union, John Paul stated, or excuse me, John Paul, Time Magazine stated that John Paul called about the Society of the Jesuits or the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, to direct the task of training priests and rebuilding the long oppressed clergy of these sensitive areas. And then look at this article from Time Magazine, December of 1990, addressing the Pope as your holiness, no small gesture for the leader of a nation and party formerly pledged to atheism. In 1989, Gorbachev promised that the Soviet, Supreme Soviet would shortly pass laws guaranteeing religious freedom for all believers. Now look at this article from U.S. News and World Report, December of 1989. The revival of religious freedom lifted an official ban on the five million member Ukrainian Catholic Church, which was one, which survived uh, which has survived underground since 1946 when Stalin ordered it absorbed into the Russian Orthodox Church. This is incredible. When you look at these Bible prophecies, the fit is amazing. And the repeat and the large principle comes together perfectly with the book of Revelation. But there's more. Notice what it says in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. It says, at the time of the end, 1798 and onward, the king of the south, atheism, would push at him, make war at him, the king of the north, papal Rome, and the king of the north, the papacy, would come against him like a whirlwind. You know, there was an article by Newsweek that described the fall of communism. And you know what that article was titled? Days of the Whirlwind. Days of the whirlwind. And so we see here an almost perfect fit with Bible prophecy and world history. Let's just parallel it. Bible prophecy and world history. Bible prophecy said he would push. World history said he pushed. Bible prophecy said it would be a war. World history, war. Bible prophecy said he'd be wounded. World history, he was wounded. Bible prophecy said he would wash over. World history, it was washing over. Bible prophecy described the whole event of the fall of communism like the days of the whirlwind. And world history confirms that and describes the same event as the days of a whirlwind. God is wanting us to understand this fulfillment of Bible prophecy so that we can be established on His sure word, that we can have faith and confidence in the word of God. In fact, some time ago, a young man who did not believe in the Bible, he was very skeptical of the Bible, asked me to prove to him that Bible prophecy was legitimate because he believed felt like Bible prophecy, Daniel's prophecies were actually written well after all of these nations came on the scene and fulfilled these prophecies and people were just looking back and writing it like a history. So I said to him, well, I have a Bible right here and this Bible was printed. It's a Thomas Nelson wide margin Bible and it was printed in 1985. I said, I picked this Bible up and um, I've had it you know, ever since. It's printed in 1985. What if I could show you a prophecy that meant exact fulfillment after 1985. He said, okay, I'm game. Let's do it. So we sat down and we went through the prophecy of Daniel 11 verses 40 and onward. We started moving through these prophecies. And when we were done, he said, I believe the Bible is the word of God because the prophecy was so clear. He was a skeptic. He was someone who felt like Bible prophecy must have been written after the time. And we went through Daniel chapter 11, 40 to 45, and he became a believer in the inspiration of the word of God. And you know what? That's why God has given us Bible prophecy, to help us to believe in his word. Let's get back to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40, because there's more for us to understand there. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now notice the last part of this verse. With chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, 
and he will enter into the countries and overflow and pass over. Now, this is archaic language when you think about it, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. I mean, the papacy wasn't using chariots and horsemen and many ships when it was coming against the Soviet Union. We talked about the Bishop of Krakow, who became John Paul II, erecting a giant cross in a square. That was how it all began. So what's the chariots and the horsemen and the many ships? Let's go to the Bible and find out. Bible prophecy tells us quite clearly, the Bible tells us quite clearly, that chariots and horsemen... Um, represent, chariots and horses represent military strength. When you had chariots and you had horsemen, you were a strong military power. It also tells us that ships represent economic strength. I'm just going to give you a couple of verses. There are many. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5 on chariots and horses. Psalm 107, verse 23 on ships equaling economic strength or merchandise, right? So what we're talking about here in this prophetic verse is we're talking about the papacy coming against the Soviet Union with military strength and economic strength. But still you might ask the question, well wait a minute, the papacy doesn't have an army. It doesn't have military strength and it certainly doesn't have the economic strength. It's not an industrial country that produces all of this you know, economic strength. Uh, it's a tiny little country. The Vatican is a tiny little state, country state right there in the middle of Rome. Well actually what this prophecy is indicating is the very thing that we've been shown in Revelation chapter 13. It's not the papacy by itself, but it's the papacy connected with another power and you'll never guess who that other power is. Well, actually you will. If you follow prophecy carefully and you understand Revelation 13, 11, which we've just alluded to, you're going to see, and history is going to confirm this, that the papacy's chariots and horsemen, military strength, and ships, economic strength, actually came from none other than the United States of America. Let's take a look. There was an article written in Time Magazine, February of 1992, and it was, it was headlined, Holy Alliance, how Ronald Reagan and the popes conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. It was described as the most holy alliance or the most secret holy alliance of all time. They met secretly in Alaska in 1982. No one knew that it was going on. Ten years later, this article was printed. No one even knew that they had conspired together, worked together to bring down communism. The article describes how step by reluctant step, the Soviets and the communist government of Poland bowed to the moral, economic, and political pressure in Posed by the Pope and the President. You see this? The Pope and the President, talking about Ronald Reagan, President of the United States. The article goes on to say one of his earliest goals as President, Reagan says, was to recognize the Vatican as a state and make them an ally. Now we're going to talk about this more, but you need to understand America to this time was always understood to be Protestant America. And Protestants and Catholics, they don't work together. History tells us this, and we'll talk about it more. In order for the uh, Reagan to work with the papacy, he had to recognize them as a state because we had never recognized the papacy as a state in all of our American history. That means we didn't have an ambassador to the Vatican. We didn't work together with the Vatican, but Ronald Reagan changed all of that. And it's going to be significant as we move on to see some of these changes and their implications. So the article goes on. During the first half of 1982, a five-part strategy emerged that was aimed at bringing about the collapse of the Soviet economy. Are you seeing this? It continues on. Elements of that strategy included the U.S. defense buildup already underway aimed at making it too costly for Soviets to compete militarily with the United States. Now let's just think about that for a second. The Bible has just told us chariots and horsemen. We looked at 1 Kings chapter 5 and there are many other verses that say that symbolizes military strength. We then realized the papacy, the papacy doesn't have military strength and all of a sudden we see this holy alliance. It's confirmed for us in Bible, in uh, current news, in history, and it tells us that the military strength that was prophetically predicted in Daniel 11 verse 40 came from the United States, which is also prophetically predicted to unite with the papacy in Revelation chapter 13 and even make an image to the papacy. So what we see here is an incredible fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Let's continue on. Reader's Digest talked about an article. They asked the question, communists, incredible collapse, how it happened? And then they answer that question, military pressure from America and its Western allies had caused the Soviets to flinch. It goes on to say this, in the 1980s, communist economies, always inefficient, went belly up. 
When the Soviet miners went on strike in 1989, their demands included soap and toilet paper and sugar. Isn't this amazing? This is the economic pressure that came against the, the communism, the king of the south, right? She'll come against him with chariots and with horses and with many ships. The economic pressure and the military pressure. All laid out for us in current news, all confirmed by current news statements, but predicted, prophetically predicted in Bible prophecy. In other words, the word of God is simply showing us ahead of time what the history of the nations is going to fulfill. What's going to happen in our history is predicted in Bible prophecy. When the prophecy is fulfilled, we can expect history to confirm that fulfillment. We don't go to history to interpret the Bible. We can't go and look at all these articles and say, well, this article, I'll take this one, this one, and this one, and I'll put it in, I'll plug it into the Bible here, and I'll make the Bible uh, say what, what happened right here. We have to let the Bible interpret itself, and that's what we've been doing. We've been letting the Bible tell us what the time of the end is. We've been letting the Bible tell us who the king of the north is. We've been letting the Bible tell us who the king of the south is. We've been letting the Bible tell us what chariots and horsemen mean. We've been letting the Bible tell us what ships means. And as we identify what those mean in the Bible, what Bible prophecy is talking about in this prophetic language, then we look for history to confirm our interpretation. And it fits like a hand in a glove. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 48 concerning Bible prophecy. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 3 and 4. God says, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them and they came to pass because I knew that you were obstinate, that your neck was as iron and your sinew, uh, iron sinew and your brow bronze. Now I just want to go back here and just look again at this article from Reader's Digest because it actually asked the question, how could the flame of freedom damaged, dampened by so many years of Soviet tyranny, burn so suddenly and brightly in Eastern Europe? And the answer to that suddenness is found in the verses we just read. God says, I've declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth out of my mouth. I caused them to hear it and suddenly I did them. Who brought down communism, according to the Bible? Who was the one that allowed this prophecy to be fulfilled? Who sets up kingdoms and bring downs kingdom, brings down kingdoms? Who set up the kingdom of Babylon and then brought it down? And Medo-Persia and then brought it down? And Greece and then brought it down? Who gives nations probationary time to prove their character and then takes them off the scene of action when they fail to fulfill God's will and allows another nation to come up. We not need to understand that God has his hand over the things of this earth. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And we're going to see this play out in the end of time. We see a terrible crisis ahead of us in Revelation chapter 13. But it's not going to be terrible for God's people. It's not going to be terrible for those who put their trust in God. Yes, it's true. God's people will not be able to buy or sell unless they receive the mark of the beast. Yes, it's true. A death decree is going to go against God's people in the end of time. However, in the end, eternity is going to stretch before us. For all those who refuse to comply with the worship of the beast, the worship of this earthly power and its image, eternity is going to stretch out before us. There's going to be a little time of trouble and then we're going to see the Lord come. We're going to lift up our heads and say, our Redeemer lives. Lo, He comes. This is our God and we have waited for Him and He will save us. Notice what Current News says about the very same thing that we talked about. The Washington, this is Time Magazine again, February of 1992. The Washington-Vatican alliance didn't cause the fall of communism, observes a U.S. official familiar with the details of the plot to keep solidarity alive. Like all great and lucky leaders, the Pope and the president exploited the forces of history to their own ends. And friends, God alone is in control of the forces of history. God alone is the one that takes down and that lifts up. And God has a, a historic, a prophetic historic outline for us in Daniel and Revelation. There's a lot of history that takes place that isn't in the Bible. But the history that connects us with Messiah, as in Daniel chapter 11, 20 to 22, the history that connects us with the new covenant, as in Daniel chapter 11, 28 to 32, the history that connects God's people people with the second coming of Jesus Christ. All of that history is right here in the Bible, specifically in Daniel and Revelation. And all of that history is 
calling us, is pleading with us to wake up, that time is short, that we are living in the time of the end, that we're seeing events take place right on schedule. God is seeking to open our eyes. He knows that we're caught up in the world. He knows our, brass, our brows like brass. He knows that we're hardened. He knows that, that we've been saying in our minds, in our hearts, if not by our actions, uh, the Lord delays his coming. And we've been eating and drinking with the, with the world and we need, to get, we need to wake up and get back on track. In fact, Jesus says, he defines Bible prophecy for us and he says in John chapter 14 and verse 29, now I have told these things before it comes to pass. I've told you before it comes to pass that when it has come to pass, you might believe, right? When we look at Bible prophecy, it's really significant for us to understand why Jesus gives us the prophecy. It's not to believe in the prophecy. We have no option but to believe in the prophecy, right? When a prophecy comes to pass, we have to believe it. When you look through the Bible and you see all the, the prophecies that were fulfilled, there's no doubt that it's fulfilled because there it is right before our eyes fulfilled. That's not the, what Jesus is pointing to here. He's not saying, now it's come, I've told you ahead of time, so when it comes to pass, you might believe that it actually happened. No, it actually happened, so you can't not believe it. You have to believe it. The reason why he tells us ahead of time is so that we will believe in him. Notice the same idea uh, shared with us in, in John chapter 13 and verse 19, but it gets more specific. Now I tell you before it comes that when it has come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. There's where we're getting, right there. This is where we need to settle in. The reason why God gives us Bible prophecy is to increase our faith in Jesus, the author of the Bible and the author of prophecy and the author of our salvation. Jesus tells us before it comes to pass so that we would say there is a God in heaven and he does understand the future and he does know what's coming and he can prepare us for that and he can deliver us from that and he's not taken off guard and he is in charge of all of this. He will overrule this for good and eventually all of this will end and we will be ushered into an eternal life with no more pain and no more sorrow, no more crying, and no more tears. What's really interesting is, is that Jesus here is talking specifically about Judas betraying him. In John chapter 13, the context is Judas betraying him, the son of perdition. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Antichrist, the lawless one, is also described as the son of perdition. Jesus tells us about the son of perdition in his day and the son of perdition in our day to encourage us to trust in him and to believe in him. So let's look at these prophecies quickly that we've discovered so far. We're in part number two of a series on Daniel 11. So far we've learned Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, and Revelation 13 begin with Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome, then pagan Rome. Revelation 13 and Daniel 11 take us into atheism, the, 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 the king of the south that pushed or warred against him, the deadly wound that was inflicted, Revelation 13 and 11, Daniel 11 verse 40. Then they take us to America, Revelation 13, I said Revelation 13, 11 on the last one, Revelation 13, 3, and then D uh, Daniel 11 verse 40, and then Revelation 13 takes us to America, Revelation 13, verse 11, and Daniel chapter 11, the chariots, the horsemen, and the many ships. So we can see from Bible prophecy that God is 100% accurate, and he's going to show us even more as we continue this study and get into Revelation chapter 17. So I want to encourage you, it's time to get serious with God. It is time to take the word of God, to pray for the Holy Spirit for understanding and to understand these prophecies as perhaps you never have before. And then it's time to share them with others because right now the Bible is being fulfilled. Revelation chapter 13, Daniel chapter 11, the papacy rising to power, the United States rising to power, controlling, seeking to control economically the word world and soon Jesus Christ is going to return in all his glory and I pray that you'll be ready and that I'll be ready for that second coming.